MedSearch 2 Clinical Conference. I'm Kathy Bosch, you know who I am. One of the instructors shared with Stephanie Cox. So our MedSearch 2 conference is going to be here in the lab, and the reason is is because we're taping this for a QSEN project, Quality Safety Education for Nurses. And this kind of ties into what Dr. Robinson has asked you to do related to clinical alarms, right? Remember the exercise I handed out as part of the syllabus? and being aware of different clinical alarms in the clinical setting. What we've noticed with students is that there's no way that we teach alarms. So how do people become aware of different alarms in different clinical settings? Um, and for years and years, it was just kind of push in the room and you kind of figured it out on your own. And that's really how it goes in clinical practice. You do get oriented to equipment, but as we know in the environment, alarms kind of become background noise. And then how do we know what to respond to, who responds, what's emergent, what do you look at, what don't you look at. And it actually kind of evolves into a greater concept called human factors. Have you heard of that? Human factors? No. no. Well, we're going to... Factors of errors. Human factors of errors. Well, actually, there's this whole thing out there related to human factors as it relates to design in work environments. And it started off in the airplane industry, if you will, nuclear power, looking at how to prevent accidents. And this has been picked up by medicine. And we know from the IOM report way back 10 years ago, errors occur on a regular basis. And conventional wisdom has told us that really, you know, just be more careful. Well, how can you be careful when there's all these contributing factors that set us up for error? So we're going to start off with an exercise, and I'm going to just divide you in half. And what I'm going to do is you're going to take a coat that I'm going to give you, and you're going to figure out how to give directions to put on the coat. Someone will have to record writing this down, okay? And then we'll exchange our written instructions to the other group, and one of them will read it out loud. And we'll talk about the issues in that particular exercise. First, I want you to spread the coat out on the table in a way that makes sense to you, so the arms are spread out and you can see them. Does that make sense? So you can see the arms. Okay, so with your right hand, pick up the coat by the left lapel. <laughs> Put your left hand Hold on. <laughs> into the left sleeve. You seriously gotta right go slower. Underneath your right hand. Okay. <laughs> we'll do it again, it's okay. Okay. Am I allowed to itch my nose? Yes. Okay. Put your hand in there. You can do it. <laughs> okay. So what am I doing? Okay. So take your left hand mm -hmm. and put it into the sleeve that's right underneath your right hand and pull it on. Wow. Okay. You're good. So now I want you to reach around behind your back on your right side with your right hand and find the coat and just pull it around you to your right side. Try to go over the shoulder, if you can. All right, now see if you can get your right hand into the right sleeve. It's a good thing you're so small. It makes it so much easier. <laughs> okay. All right, are we including buttoning and stuff? Oh, okay. All right, go ahead and butter up however it makes sense. Give it a shot, let's see what happens. <laughs> Try to line the buttons up from the top to the bottom. So find the top button and the top buttonhole and put them together. And go ahead and just sequentially go down the line and find the next one. Alice, how you doing? Sorry. Uh, I got the first three steps. Okay, okay. <laughs> we can do it again. Yeah, we're gonna have to. I just wanted to see if it would work or not. I think it totally worked. Can I fix okay. my collar? Absolutely. You should me too. I think you should make yourself look spiffy. <laughs> All right. So we're going to open up the, the coat and remove the hanger if there okay, is one. Already. 
We're going to turn it slowly so that the back is facing the same direction as your back. You're going to make sure the label is in the right position. You're going to put your right hand into the right sleeve of the jacket. <laughs> Okay, you're going to drop. drop your left, drop with your left. You're going to put your left hand behind <laughs> yourself. You're going to reach for the left armhole of the jacket and insert your arm into it. You're going to pull the jacket onto your shoulders. <laughs> and you're dressed. Okay. So doing this little simple exercise, was it all that simple? Putting on a jacket. Was it? Was it? Mm -hmm. I was, um, you don't realize how many steps there are. You don't realize how many steps there are. What other barriers did you encounter? <laughs> Left right is confusing. Left right is confusing. Mm -hmm. Okay. What else? front and back is confusing too. Okay, so dimensions can be confusing in describing. What about recording? <laughs> that was the main problem, was that I couldn't transcribe as fast as she was giving okay. the instructions. Okay, so there's a delay in receiving information to be able to get it jotted down. And we didn't, you don't want to pause because you've got somebody standing in an awkward spot, so you kind of have to keep moving. Okay, great. So all of these things kind of illustrate that whatever we do, we kind of have a mental model that we're working with when we do things. And to be able to describe them, there's room for error. And I think one of the key pieces related to errors is how many people haven't made an error in their life. <laughs> okay, nobody. So when we look at errors in the medical setting, what we do know is that everybody makes errors, so it's not a personnel issue entirely. Sure, there's attitude and knowledge piece, but everybody makes errors. So it's not entirely a personnel issue. It just doesn't belong to Alice. It just doesn't belong to me. More than likely, whatever I'm doing, work I am doing, I am somehow in a system that has been created that I work with that will set me up for an error or I will make an error in unconscious or not. Okay? So what I'd like to do is at this moment is give the instructions written by one group for the person from the other group to just stand right up here and put their jacket on as written step by step. So Alice, you weren't in Lynn's group, so grab a jacket and I want you to stand right in front of me and Lynn is going to read step by step the instructions of putting the coat on or the jacket on. Okay. First, open up coat. Remove the hanger if there is one. Turn it slowly so that back facing the same direction. Make sure label in the right position. Yeah. Yeah, there. Pull right hand into right sleeve of jacket. <laughs> drop with your left hand. Drop your left hand. <laughs> but at the same time, you have to hold your right hand into right sleeve. <laughs> really die into right sleeve. <laughs> hand what? I mean, really put your hand down the sleeve, not just, yeah. And uh, <laughs> put your left hand behind yourself. <laughs> Reach for left armhole. Okay. Then I Here we go. <laughs> you will insert arm into left armhole. And then pull up your coat. There we go. There you go. Very good. <laughs> All right. Let's do the other group. All right. So spread the coat out on the table in a way that makes sense to you. <laughs> okay. Okay. And with your right hand, pick up the left lapel of the coat. Left. <laughs> left? Left. Right hand, left lapel. <laughs> right hand? Yeah. 
There you go. Perfect. That's, that's perfect. Okay. No, right hand. Left, <laughs> left lapel. <laughs> so that's your right hand. There you go. You got it. You got it right there. Pick it up. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Diane, right right hand, left lapel. <laughs> Then, no, I know. I like so. If you're looking at the jacket, so put the let's start over. So put the coat on the table in a way that makes sense to you. But I'll need, flip it over. No, this is the way that makes sense. Okay. To you. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll add a new phrase in. With your right hand, mm -hmm. pick up the left lapel as it would be on a person that was already wearing the jacket. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's draw this to a close. Yeah. Let's draw this to a close. Start pointing. Yeah. Your point, and the point was proved when place the code on the table that makes sense yeah, to you. So we're specific. working with different mental models, and if you think about it, when you're yeah. working in the clinical setting, people have different mental models that they're working with, not only to communicate but to provide instruction. So as we pass information that relates to the patient, we have a context that we're thinking about, right? Makes sense. So let's think in terms of human factors. So we know what happens when we're trying to describe something, we know that errors occur, so we look for problems. It's just doing simple instructions, it's fraught with errors because we have different mental models, different ways of approaching things. And with that being said, in the clinical setting, there's lots of rules um, and different mental models that people use when they're communicating. So looking at a problem, we know that there's different categories of problems. And the first one are description errors. And what do you think description errors are in the clinical setting? Because what you did was describe something, a process. Talking about different things. Right, talking about different things. So it's the right action to the wrong object. Right hand, left hand. Place it in what makes sense to you. A different mental model there. The next one is capture errors. Any idea what a capture error is? Different ways of recording things? Could be different ways of recording things. Actually, it's different ways of recording things or things that we do out of habit. So we're recording the same way, the same thing every time. So when you're using your tool and keeping track of your time and all of that stuff, you have a tendency to do things the same way every time, right? What do you miss when you do have a habit? Variations. Variations. Or the ability to look at a broader picture to see things differently from someone else's perspective, right? or the ability in this place to follow instructions. And Diane, you were perfect in saying, I laid the coat down as it made sense to me. Right? Okay, the other one is rule-based errors. So what's a rule-based error? What can you think that might be? Think about the clinical setting. We have policies, procedures, protocols. Do we follow them? Yeah. Do they apply for every situation? Probably not, but we kind of get into this whole little hang-up where we're used to doing the same thing, a capture error, and applying a pro protocol to the same situation time and time again and not being open that maybe application or rule-based thing isn't appropriate for that particular patient. Okay. So not looking, again, for nuances, variability, or patient-specific care, if you will. And then the last piece is knowledge-based error. And what is a knowledge-based error? A deficit in your understanding of whatever the situation is. Right, a deficit in understanding. What else might it be? Lack of systemic knowledge. Lack of system acknowledgement. So a failure to consider other alternatives. So in putting on the coat, this makes sense to me. Now, what did Katie respond to? Well, let's add this a little bit differently now to accommodate for someone else's making sense. Okay? 
So this is part of human factors. And what do we know a human factors is and how does it pertain to the clinical setting because we're going to eventually get to clinical alarms is informally human factors is why stuff doesn't work. Okay, So you've all been in the clinical setting. Can you give me a quick example of something that doesn't work? Anybody? Alarms don't work very well for patients who are confused and can't understand the information that you're giving them about you need to call for help before they get out of Okay. So looking at human factors design and the use of bed alarms, is it appropriate for all situations? We want to keep the call for somebody. What do you think is happening with a bed alarm? It's going off. Going all off the all the time. What it happens to staff off. response with that? It goes down. Goes down. Why? Because people assume that the person's just getting out of bed like they did for the 20th time. Right. When this time it could really be an emergency. Right. So, again, that's part of human factors design in designing a bed alarm. It goes off the same for every situation, and we get used to that and start making assumptions. So it goes back to what? Capture and rule-based type errors. Right? Make sense? That's a really good one from a patient safety. So one of the things that we know in the clinical setting as it relates to human factors and related to design is our interaction with machines and equipment and that's probably the most researched area. And that'll go into clinical alarms when you're in, and we're going to do this on the units. Some of you will be in critical care, some of you won't, that's fine, but paying attention to how those machines are alarming. What are the components that cause somebody to react or not react, if you will. So it's part of design. What else do we know about human factors as it relates to design? When we get used to hearing something, what do we do? We ignore it? And what does it have a negative impact in the work environment? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it impacts patient safety. What else does staff do when something isn't working right? Shut it off. Shut it off. Okay. What else do they do? Work around it. Work around it. And that's probably more often what staff do is to work around it. This is a nuisance, so I'm going to circumvent why this alarm is this way or why this machine is working this way. Okay? Workarounds aren't always safe, um, and they tend to lead us into flawed behaviors, so developing habits that aren't safe. And then what's the last thing related to design? particularly of machines, using the bed alarm. They're imperfect. They're imperfect, leading to unintended consequences. So if we're not paying attention anymore, we end up having a patient fall with an injury. Okay. So what else do we know related to just machines in general? Do they cause a stress? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do they cause us to use them incorrectly? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we get tired of dealing with it? Do you develop a <laughs> fatigue related to it? How many times do I have to go back to that pump? Do we really solve the problem or do we just turn it off or hit the silence button? We mm -hmm. end up with a fatigue factor. So if you think of all those things and that just in the design of something alone and developing habits, knowledge error, rule-based description type errors, we now go into a negative impact in that work environment. What else in the work environment contributes to errors, just in general? Not related to alarms, but just in general. Distractions. Distractions is a big one. What else? Time. Time. So everything is done on a speedy time. And if we're pushed, we may make errors. What else? Staffing, like staff to patient ratio. Okay, so there's some staffing implications, but just look, look at the environment. Is noise a factor? Mm -hmm. Is lighting a factor? Mm -hmm. Is physical layout a factor? Yeah. Okay, so you get tired running the halls. Where's the nurse's station? Where's the Pixis machine located? So design is another huge piece as it relates to negative or human factors related to a work environment. All of you are tired after 36 hours, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we do know, and from the literature, that fatigue is a huge contributing factor to errors in the clinical environment. So some agencies have a policy, no more than 36 hours a week. What about some of the workarounds? Did you see any of those in the clinical setting? An example, anybody? 
getting meds out of the refrigerator, like to get insulin out or something like that, you can access another med and then cancel it and mm -hmm. to take in medication out of the refrigerator or see if it's there. Okay, so taking meds out of the refrigerator is manipulating the system to keep that refrigerator door open. Mm -hmm. Does it actually solve the problem? No. no, no, it doesn't. And why do we continue to do workarounds? What are we trying to maintain? Efficiency. Not only efficiency, but more important than that is our frame of reference, our mental frame, our, our way of thinking, if you will. It constantly reinforces it because we don't want to let it go. Is it easy to learn something new? Or is it easy to solve a problem? No, it's easier to do a workaround to maintain, ah, this is what I need. Anything else? Again, it goes back to capture. We're creatures of habit, which is why we do workarounds. I've learned it one way, and this is the way I'm going to do it, even though I have new equipment. I'm going to adapt that to how I'm used to working. Make sense? Okay, so putting on the coat, we all have one way to put on a coat. And when you have to describe it to somebody else, it's like, I never put it on that way. It doesn't fit the way that I'm habitually used to putting on a coat because we don't think about it all the time. All right. <clears throat> Some unintended consequences related to human factors and design. What happens? We come up with a solution, perhaps. We put the coat on. What did it create? Confusion. Confusion. So sometimes the solution to something or doing something creates another problem. So when we look at system sort of things as it relates to clinical alarms, if new equipment is introduced into the environment, how do we train people? How do we keep them aware? What is the impact throughout the entire system related to something as simple as a new piece of equipment? So again, Human Factors is looking at what is a typical human response? What is the work environment? So there's psychology, physiology involved, Lots of different things that are considered. What about cognitive processes? What was the big thing on that first clinical shift that I asked you all about? Where's your tool? Where's your brain? So another type of thing that happens related to human factors are cognitive processes with each individual. And that's perception, long-term memory, and working memory. So we all have different perceptions, right? We all know how to lay that coat down, what makes sense to me. will vary from every individual in this room. And again, I just love that example because you just slipped right into it. Somehow I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> but perception is what? Sensory. Mm -hmm. So think about all the senses. So if you have a stuffy nose, what might you miss? Smells. 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 You know, could be something odiferous from a patient, a purulent wound that you might not smell, which could contribute to an error in reporting something, right? What do we know about long-term memory? It's imperfect. It's imperfect. And what interrupts long-term memory? Head injuries? <laughs> I'm getting at it. But we heard it earlier from Anne, distraction. So we've learned how to do things, and then as we're in the process of doing something and we get distracted, what happens? We may skip a step because we're back into that habit of doing something. So we may skip a step. Multitasking, you know, we say we multitask all the time. That also affects long-term memory because it's like, what was I doing? Where did I leave off on this particular task? So you're taking a phone call and pouring meds at the same time. So what, think about the equipment in the clinical environment at University Hospital. They carry phones. The phone rings and you're in the middle of pulling medication out of the Pixis. Are you going to pull the wrong thing? Hopefully you'll catch it at the barcode piece. 
But again, there's an interruption and a distraction. What is working memory? Is, do anyone know what that means, working memory? Like muscle memory? Kind of? No, sort of, except cognitive. Right. Okay. It's just being able to think, thinking on your feet. Okay. So human factors also looks at cognitive processes. And when we're overloaded through physical or emotional stuff that we're carrying around ourselves, physical exhaustion from walking great lengths on a unit or lifting people all day or doing whatever, the physical nature of the job can affect our working memory. In addition to our emotional responses to what's going on in the clinical setting, much less what's going on at home. So thinking about those things. So looking at the human experience, if you will, when we're looking at human factors and designing things in that environment that mitigate those types of things that go on naturally for all of us because remember we all make mistakes so it can't be a personnel issue right okay last one human factors and interactions with others what is the major thing that we do with other people in the clinical setting talk to them, talk to them. we communicate with them so again when we're communicating with somebody else what are some of the things that occur that will cause an error when we communicate. Word, different words mean different things. Different words mean different things. Okay? So again, we've heard that here already in our coat piece. Different words mean different things. What else? How about auditory and visual disturbances? Right? Either by the person who's giving the communication or the person who's receiving it. So was if I had handed instructions to somebody else who had written them, who didn't write them, they might have difficulty reading those instructions based on handwriting, right? <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time in the clinical setting if you're looking at handwritten orders. Uh, and then the other piece we didn't quite see here, but happens all the time related to communication. If you remember, that communication is, what, 93% what? Body language. Body language. 7% is actually the spoken word. So what did we see in this exercise about putting on the coat? What did Katie try to do? Modify. Demonstrate. Demonstrate. Yeah. So <laughs> interjecting <laughs> in, this is where you need to go. Okay. So taking advantage of using body to illustrate a point. And we do that naturally all the time. Okay. And then we have that whole mental model piece, which kind of correlates with those cognitive processes. This is what's ingrained in our head, a generalization of how things should be. And it's kind of hard to leap out of that, if you will. I hear something, I see something, I draw, based on a little bit of information with that, I draw a conclusion or a picture in my head of what that means. Do we all do that? Take some little pieces of information and make a generalization, if you will, thinking this is what it really means. So when you have two different mental models, what happens? Two different people have two different mental models. It's a problem with the communication. Problem with communication. Okay. Now you have a group. What happens? It magnifies the problem. Magnifies the problem. And so we're expected to function as teams. So one of the things in looking at human factors and working in that team is everybody understand what is the work that's to be done. So that gets into who's doing what on the unit, how you're communicating, and that we have effective communication to be able to do that, right? Okay. And you're thinking, what does this have to do with alarms? Well, way related to the clinical alarms, it has to do with who's responding to alarms. Have you ever seen an alarm going off or hear one going off and no one do anything? Yeah. I have this in med surge one all the time. I'm standing outside the room, the IV is going beep, 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 and I say to the student, isn't that your patient? No. <laughs> They're not going to respond to the alarm. They hear it but they're not part of the team, that it's okay to respond to the alarm. So that's, an, again, something else that needs to be looked at in looking at human factors. All right. So let's look very quickly at some examples of human factors in healthcare. Eye-hand coordination. An example? Mm -hmm. 
Pulling up, <laughs> pulling up medications in a syringe. Okay, pulling up medications in a syringe. Great example. That is a human factor, being able to do a psychomotor skill. What about hearing and noise? What might you see in the healthcare setting? Background noise makes it hard to hear, like breath sounds. Okay, example. background noise. So the ambient noise on the unit. If you went to the neonatal intensive care unit, you would see an entirely different clinical environment. Mm -hmm. It's dark, it's quiet for babies to grow. Would they thrive up on oncology? Probably not. Okay? What about sleep deprivation? It's a human factor. The 24 hour operation, they're um, it's perpetually, you know, half the day is spent with people who are not on a natural sleep cycle. Okay. So. Okay. Or it could be shift work. Well, I mean, that's it, yeah. Yeah. Or it could be working three in a row. Mm -hmm. So we know, <laughs> we know that fatigue is a huge issue. Visual distractions as a human factor. Mm -hmm. What might we see in the clinical setting? There's all these wires going everywhere. Okay. So wires going everywhere. How many of you looked at the monitor? So you're looking at the monitor, but you're not looking at the patient. You'll see this in critical care. They have monitors right there at the bedside, and they're looking at the monitor. Is anybody looking at the patient? What's alarming? Looking at the monitor. Look at the patient. The two may not go together at times. So think in terms of human factors and the things that you're bringing into the clinical study and how the environment is considering those pieces. Okay? So, I'm going to get the clinical alarm safety exercise and hand it out. So record the date, time, location, type of alarm, interpretation of the alarm, and action taken by you or other clinicians related to the alarm. So this can be in the patient's room. It can be what you hear in the hallway. It could be what you hear as you're walking by somewhere. Okay, so you don't have to be standing in one location. And you want to spend about two hours. Don't take any more time because you, you are going to do this exercise for a time-limited piece and see how many different alarms that you might encounter during that time. So as you're doing this, you're not doing patient care. You may be walking around the unit. You may be in one room depending on your location. And I would suggest that you step outside the room and walk the unit and see what you hear and see what different people's responses are. And find out who those clinicians are who are responding to it. You look confused, Alice. You would like us to take two hours out of our patient care? This is on, on the odd stay. Mm -hmm. Oh, on the observation yeah. day yeah. in this I see you. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what we know, and there's definitions in the clinical setting, what an alarm is. It's a signal that utilizes an auditory or visual cue to warn or alert. So that's what they consider an alarm. A clinical alarm is notification from a device that is used to diagnose, treat, or monitor a patient. So there's different types of alarms. You'll want to distinguish between those two. Does that make sense? So an alarm might be that something arrived in the tube vacuum tube system and the thing goes off. So now we're going to try to tune you into looking at different types of alarms that you may be hearing, which is why I want you to move on around on the unit and be in different places to be able to hear different things. Okay. Some of them are patient-centered, IV pumps being a big one, are patient-centered. Some are not. Cell phones are not patient-centered. They're nurse-centered. So you want to distinguish, is it a patient-centered alarm? Is it a provider or a non-patient-centered alarm? Does that make sense? Okay. And then we'll convene at clinical conference just to go over different types of alarms and who responded. And probably more importantly, how long did it take to respond? And what was the intervention by the responder? Why are we doing this? Awareness. Awareness, okay. 
because it's part of the work environment that we're trying to teach a little bit differently so that when you're in the clinical setting you can solve those problems and not create new problems. You can point out here's the workaround. Here's something that we could be doing differently and as as people coming, you're about ready to graduate. I know most of you will be done in May, I think. In fact, all of you. Um, you're going to be looking at what can you add to the environment because you're coming in with what? A fresh set of eyes and a different knowledge base and a different mindset and not having some of these types of errors that clinicians who worked out there for a while already have ingrained in them. You have a mental model, that's good. You have some habits that you knew in the clinical environment. Any questions about the exercise? I know two hours seems like a lot of time, but it'll go quickly because you'll be distracted by other things that are going on. And hopefully you're responding to alarms. Okay? We're done.